O sing to the Lord a new song, sing to the Lord all the earth, for he comes, he comes to judge the earth, he will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. Let us pray. Great art thou, O Lord, and greatly to be praised. Great is thy power and thy wisdom is infinite, thee would we praise without ceasing. Thou callest us to delight in praise, for thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts, hearts are restless till they rest in thee. To whom with the Son and the Holy Ghost all glory, praise, and honor be ascribed both now and evermore. Amen. Let us make our confession unto Almighty God. Let us pray. Lord God, we come before you and your world confessing our sin. We are bored in a world of excitement, depressed in a world of brilliant power and beauty, lethargic when your call is to vital action and living, numb and cold when you are sensitive and full of love. Bring us into radical birth and life, O God, that we may live fully, jubilantly, and with love for the sake of all that is crucial and good in this world. Make us thankful that we can act. Amen. Ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. 
For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Thanks be to God. Amen. Probably a minister should never do this, but I feel that I really must admit something of my pessimism as I thought about today, the 6th of July, the 4th of July weekend. I did not expect to see as many faces here as I see this morning. We are happy that you are here, though. We welcome you to this service of worship. It is good to see that you continue to come to worship together, even during the summer months when so many are gone, so many are on vacation. To let us know of your presence today, we ask that you fill in the attendance registration slip. And having filled it in, if you will pass it to the center aisle, the ushers will pick them up. I would hope that as much as possible when you are on vacation, that wherever you are, you will make a point of attending the church at that place. It is an exciting experience to go to a different church to see something of how their worship service is conducted. Last Sunday, my family and I worshiped at the First United Methodist Church in Vancouver, Washington, and it was an exciting experience for us to sit as part of the congregation in different surroundings with a different minister preaching and a different people. We're happy to be back here this morning. It's always a great privilege when a congregation and a minister has the opportunity of baptizing an infant. Lynn and Alta Crawford bring a child this morning to receive the sacrament of baptism. Will you come? An established fact of life in the United States in the latter part of the 20th century is the tremendous mobility with which we live. Mobility means a tremendous amount for the church because it means that continually, continuously there are new people moving into a community and thus new people to take their places as responsibility and leadership in a church. Unfortunately, mobility is a two-way street, though. It gives, but it also takes away. It takes away from us the Crawfords very shortly who will be going to Yakima to live. We have benefited greatly from their presence for a little over four years now. Alta has served time after time as a church school teacher. She's been active in the Women's Society, serving as the chairman of a circle this past year. Lynn has, I think, occupied most every job there is to be occupied in the church, from being a Sunday school teacher to being church school superintendent to being our lay leader and recently being elected chairman of our administrative board. We hate to see them go. We will miss them. Our thanks goes to them for all that they have meant to us for these more than four years. We look forward to seeing you as you return to visit in Walla Walla and hope you all the happiness as you go to your new home. The responsive act of praise is numbered 562. Entitled, In Thee I Trust. Let us stand as we read responsively. <clears throat> to thee, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, to thee I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not Make me to know thy ways, O Lord. Me Lead me in thy truth and teach me. Be mindful of thy mercy, O Lord, and of thy steadfast love. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. Good and upright is the Lord. He leads the humble in what is right. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness. For thy name's sake, O Lord, 
Who is the man that fears the Lord? The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him. May integrity and uprightness preserve me. kings and empires now. Testament lesson is the 15th chapter of Acts, beginning with the first verse. Some men came from Judea to Antioch and started teaching the brothers, you cannot be saved unless you are circumcised as the law of Moses requires. The apostles and the elders met together to consider this question. And after a long debate, Peter stood up and said, My brothers, you know that a long time ago God chose me from among you to preach the message of good news to the Gentiles so that they could hear and believe. And God, who knows the hearts of men, showed his approval of the Gentiles by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he had to us. He made no difference between us and them. He forgave them their sins because they believed. So then, why do you want to put God to the test now by laying a load on the backs of the believers which neither our ancestors nor we ourselves were able to carry? No, we believe and are saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they are. Let us pray. O thou who didst come as the bringer of life, the bringer of that which enlivens and transforms the drabness of existence into the abundant life, we come to this place called thy house, aware of the poverty of the quality of our own lives, and aware of the drabness, the deadness of so much of our lives, which should reflect the aliveness brought by thy life-giving spirit. And this deadness in our lives we have confessed to thee. But we are here, O Lord, not only to confess, but also because thou hast promised that those who seek find, and for those who knock, the door is opened. 
We come seeking the power and love with which thou hast promised to fill our lives. How it is possible, O Lord, to transform the drab deadness into colorful, joyful, powerful, loving lives is beyond our comprehensions, for it seems so hopeless. But here we are, trusting in thy power and strength that thou canst enable the transformation which by our own power and strength is impossible. For thy promise, we are thankful. For without thy promise, there is no hope. On this day, O Lord, we also pray for our country, set in a time of uncertainty. We pray for the leaders of our national government that they may make those decisions which will bring a greater degree of peace on thy earth. That they may make those decisions which reflect a concern for the sacredness of life and of human values. Grant that for our country, as for our individual lives, we may ever be receptive to thy judgment which condemns our sins. For we are aware that the only path to renewal and strength in life leads first through the valley of painful confession and repentance. Enable us, O Lord, to accept the pain and discomfort of thy scrutinizing, revealing light so that we may also know the joy of thy mercy and renewing love. This is our prayer, O Lord which we offer in the name of thy Son, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The hymn is number 297.
Religion is a restraining force. Man, being basically evil, needs to have the restraints which religion puts on him and on his actions. For if man were set loose to be himself, there would be chaos. The religious person then, the person who does his duty, who accepts the burden of the restraints put upon him and his actions, the man who doesn't let himself go. This is a very interesting way of regarding religion and of regarding Christianity. The idea that man was created to be subject to some type of restraining system of rules and regulations, external laws. The idea then also that maybe if he does subject himself to these restraints, to these laws, that maybe in the end there will be a reward for him. The goal of his life then, that of ending up at the end without any black marks on his record. Negative religion. An interesting idea, especially interesting as it is compared to Jesus and what Jesus taught. Negative religion, interesting especially as it is compared with Jesus, the one who came so that we may have life and so that we may have it abundantly. In the face of this negative religion, a religion of external restraints, external burdens, we receive the crystal clear message of Jesus that he came to set man free from the restraints which would deny life to him. In fact, this is precisely how Jesus got into trouble in his life. Recall, as the Gospel of Mark reminds us, that Jesus didn't follow all the rules for fasting as those religious leaders before him had done, as John the Baptist has, had done. But rather he and his disciples were, would have a gay time, not fasting, not putting on a long face with sadness, but enjoying life. And the religious leaders came up to him and criticized him of this. What are you doing? Not putting these restraints upon your actions. Recall on another occasion, where Jesus on the Sabbath comes across a man with a paralyzed hand, a withered hand, and having concern for humanity and human values, Jesus heals the hand, makes it whole, again being criticized by the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the scribes. What are you doing performing this act of work on the Sabbath? Jesus not being restrained by all the external rules and laws and regulations, saying that he could not lift a finger on the Sabbath. And also, again, on the Sabbath, as he and his disciples were walking through the grain fields, plucking some of the grain, rubbing it and eating it, again criticized, you're working on the Sabbath. And Jesus replied to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The world was made for man. Man was not made to be subject to rules and reg regulations, burdens and restraints. Man was made to live in this good earth which God has created. And finally, Jesus says to these religious leaders, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandments of God in order to keep your tradition. The constant battle then going on between Jesus and those religious leaders in his day, Jesus trying to bring life and bring it abundantly, whereas the tradition imposed restraints, burdens upon man. Well, the controversy did not end with Jesus' death, but it continued even into the early church, as we were reminded in the scripture lesson this morning. The controversy in the early church between those with Jewish background and those who did not have the Jewish background, the Gentiles, those with the Jewish background saying all those who become Christians have to be circumcised, have to subject themselves to this external sign, this burden. But the Gentiles saying, no, Christianity is not something of externals. Christianity instead is something of the heart. Someone has said that man will not be free until every king is in his grave and every priest is beheaded. Well, it's tragic when we hold a view of Christianity that 
that blocks our participation in the religion of Jesus. Tragic when we hold a view of Christianity which is nothing more than a burden upon us and the only way that we can be free is to get rid of the religion. Tragic when we hold a view of Christianity and religion which only requires us to participate in some type of, of moral system. Religion as we have created it, missing the joyful, jubilant religion which Jesus came bringing to man. One time a man by the name of Wallstrom, something of an ingenious tinkerer, got hold of an old bomb site. And he decided to take it apart to see what made it work. He took all the parts apart from each other. And then he reached the point where it was then time to put the bomb site back together. Well, Wallstrom started to work on this and found out when he neared the end that he had some parts left over, some spare parts. And he decided rather than throw them away, he would just make them part of his machine. So he began to put them on here and there on the machine, and his neighbors and friends kind of got into the swing of things and started bringing him more additional parts from other machines. And Wallstrom, an ingenious, tinkering man, added all of these parts to the machine and built a tremendous, huge machine with over 10,000 parts to it, 3,000 of which moved. And when he turned on his machine, bells would ring, lights would flash, all kinds of noise would be made, pulleys would revolve, 3,000 moving parts. Wallstrom's wonder, the only trouble with Wallstrom's wonder was that it really didn't do anything. It had no purpose. It didn't perform any task. Well, how pathetic when we end up likewise with a religious system, a religion, all of the elaborations, a tremendous impressive system. But really, what does it do for me? What does it do for me? Burdens and restraints that miss the point of true religion. External restraints upon me, putting a burden upon me rather than bringing to me joy and freedom and new life. Well, I think there are at least two fallacies in a religion of burdens and restraints, a religion of external things, controlling my actions. First, such a view of religion as something external restraining me has a mistaken view of man. And second, it has a mistaken view of the goal of Christianity. Let us look at these two mistaken ideas which I feel that a religion of external burdens has. As long as a religion merely brings restraints, external things, controlling my actions, controlling the actions of a man, it really doesn't touch the real man. For man is much more than just action. You can mold a person's actions to perfection in the way that you want, it, want them to be. And yet, this in no way necessarily touches the way that he feels and that he thinks. I think right here we see something which is as phony as you can find any place. A religion which molds a man's actions, the way he behaves, but leaves the way that he thinks, the way that he feels, untouched. The external not matching the internal. A real phoniness, just conforming. We used to talk a lot about the one-day Christians who went to church on Sunday and yet what they did on Sunday didn't have anything to do with the, the rest of their lives, the other days of the week. A real phoniness, when religion means nothing more than just conforming in a certain way, performing certain religious acts, but really having nothing to do with your motivations the way that you feel and think. Well, certainly Jesus realized that man was much more than just his actions and just the externals, as does the church today. And neither the church nor Jesus are interested in the superficial, not interested simply in the externals, but rather interested in the person. The church used to be tremendously moralistic, or at least, in my opinion, it used to be tremendously moralistic. It said to us, if you do this, this, and this, and do not do this, this, and this, then you're a good person. Everything is okay. 
Well, I think it's tremendously sad when we find a person today who still feels that religion is a matter of doing this, this, and this, and not doing these other things. The person who says, what more is Christianity than just the Ten Commandments? If a person lives in the right manner, what more is there? Well, I feel that the church today is not moralistic, but rather I feel that the church recognizes the unique position which it occupies in society. For most every other organization and institution in society is concerned only with participation, concerned only that the person be part of it and do certain acts, help bring off certain projects. The church certainly, too, is interested in participation on the part of the individual. But it's also concerned with more than just participation, more than just the externals. It's concerned about the person. It's concerned about those things deep within the person. It's concerned about the heart. It's concerned about the feelings. It's concerned about the motivations. I think that the sermon on Sunday morning, when it is what it should be, is much more than just trying to get people to behave in certain ways. But rather, the sermon is one of the most private moments in a person's week. For it is a time when he sits and looks into his own life, deep into his own life, looking at what is hidden from other persons, looking at truly what does motivate him, looking at the way in which he truly does feel about his neighbor, looking at that which truly does carry him in the direction in which he is going. Well, the church is doing no more than simply following Jesus in this, recalling the Sermon on the Mount, a rather startling message found in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says to us that it is meaningless just to do good things, but rather the thing of importance is found within the heart, the motivation which lies behind the actions. You see, the simple, profound truth is that God simply is not interested in making automatons, robots, out of us. If God was simply interested only in people acting in a certain way, he could have some way taken away our freedom of will. And thus he would have had no problems at all. But rather God is interested in the motivations, in those things deep within the life of a person. We become so accustomed to judging by externals that it is tremendously reassuring to hear that God does not judge just by externals. Tremendously reassuring and yet awesome and frightening to know that God sees more, that God sees beyond the surface things. In the scripture lesson read this morning, we were reminded that God knows the hearts of men. Well, there are some times when we, when we want to be known, but there are other times when we just as soon not be known. It is a frightening thing to know that we cannot cover up who we are, and what we are. The psalmist experienced something of this awesome experience and expresses it in the 139th Psalm, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest when I sit down, when I rise up. Thou discernest my thoughts from afar. Thou searchest out my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, lo, O Lord, Thou knowest it all together. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? You see, God is not fooled by externals, nor is he simply interested in externals. You see, again, the uniqueness of Christianity, an interest in the total man, not just in the physical, not just in the spiritual, not just in what he can produce with his hands, but interested in the total man. And what a valuable institution the church is then within a society which so easily slips into an interest merely in the externals, merely in the amount which a person can produce, merely in the way a person behaves, 
what a tremendously valuable institution the church is, an institution which is interested in more than merely externals, but interested in the total man, that which lies deep within his life. Well, a religion of burdens, a religion of restraints, a religion merely of external things controlling our actions, containing two fallacies. On the one hand, an inadequate view of man, a mistaken view of man, for man is more than merely externals. On the other hand, also a mistaken view of the goal of Christianity. I think we need to ask, what is our goal in Christianity? What are we after in Christianity? Why bother? What is our motivation for being part of the church, for attempting to be Christians? Well, for some, the motivation, undoubtedly, is simply the interest to impress people. The motivation, very much as you would find in a child who constantly looks to those persons about him for approval of his actions, for judgment of his actions, and he comes to know something of his, his own esteem by what other people say about him. So Christianity, based on the motivation of wanting approval of others, if Christianity is a, merely, a matter merely of externals, then it lends itself to use in this way. We tend to fall into the trap of doing certain things in order to impress people to make them think we are certain types of persons. For some, the motivation within Christianity is that of looking for some reward in the future, the old business of heaven and hell, knowing, feeling that if you do certain things that then you will eventually be rewarded. Again, if Christianity merely is a matter of externals, how easy to fall into this trap. The tendency to keep account of how you stand I have not committed adultery, I have not killed, I have given to the poor, I have said my prayers, I have even led some battles in the area of civil and human rights. I have built up these credits, how happy I am that I will find favor in the eyes of God on that future day. I think that if our goal simply is approval or simply a matter of future reward, that Christianity for us remains nothing more than a burden, something which we endure for the sake of something else. We feel that, that if we do these things, if we endure through them, then we will eventually get our reward. But I feel that Christianity instead is something which is rewarding in itself. And until we are Christians simply for the joy it brings to us, I feel that in some way we're missing out if Christianity for us is no more than a matter of externals, of restraints, of burdens, I feel that we have not yet cited the true goal of our religion. I think we see something of the same in other areas of life. Many people would endure the, what they would regard as the hardships of many days in a classroom for the sake of gaining a diploma or a degree. The burden, enduring the burden, for the sake of some reward out there at the end. How pathetic, rather than feeling that there is a joy in learning, how pathetic to work for the goal at the end rather than being motivated out of the desire to learn. You see, in life there are some things which we, however, do suffer through, feeling that they have to be done. That's the way that it is. But then there are other things which we do because they are rewarding in themselves. I think that it is very important for us to make up our minds which category Christianity fits into. Something that we endure, that we suffer through, because it just has to be that way. Or something that we are a part of because it is rewarding in itself. Which category does Christianity fit into? Well, for many, I feel that Christianity has not yet become what it was intended to become. For I feel that it was intended to become something which was, is rewarding in itself, not a burden, not a matter of restraints, not a matter of externals, endured for the sake of something else. But if this is true, where is the reward? Where is the payoff? 
We're pragmatic people. Where is this joy that we speak of? Well, certainly this reward, this joy, does not necessarily come in the form of worldly success. For many times, the Christian who truly takes seriously his faith will instead of worldly success find suffering and rejection and failure. But instead, the biblical way of speaking of this payoff, this reward, speaks of it in terms of the Holy Spirit being given to us in this life, in the present. The Holy Spirit given to us. While I am less interested in precisely what the Holy Spirit is, and more interested instead of what does this Holy Spirit do for us? What practical difference does this make in our lives? Well, for many, the presence of the Holy Spirit, this gift from God, the practical difference, is found essentially in the world becoming a different place for them. Circumstances no longer have power to paralyze. Death no longer has power to strike fear. Wealth and influence no longer power to create insatiable desires. The promise given to us is that the world literally can become a different place for us and that the burden of existence can be transformed into the joy of life. And yet, really, the world becoming different, hardly. It's just that we began to see the world as God created it to be. It's just that we began to see the world as a place where man is to find fullness and joy. To see the world as a place where man is to participate in meaningful relationships of love. A place where man is to be born, to have a childhood, to work, to play, to grow old. All of which is good. The world is a place for the abundant, for the abundant enlivened life, regardless of the circumstances which surround us, rather than the world as a place for the hard, cruel, selfish battle to survive. The world actually becoming different. No, not really. A person just beginning to see the world as God created it rather than seeing it as a loveless, joyless jungle of existence. This is what the Holy Spirit does. It gives us new sight. It gives us a new seeing. It gives us a new life. Well, it sounds trite. And yet, what a difference it makes. For the person who begins to see differently, the world for him literally does become different. And Christianity for him becomes not the external burdens to be endured for the sake of some future reward, but rather Christianity becomes the life-giving, the life-transforming power, which right now touches the very depths of his being and brings to him new life. Christianity, so often a burden, a restraint, so often a matter of externals, not really touching the person, endured for the sake of approval, the approval of men or the approval of God. What a pity to transform Jesus into the bringer of burdens rather than seeing him as the bringer of life, the bringer of the abundant life. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy places, but also with him who is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite. Let us pray. O thou who art the true son of the world, ever rising and ever going down, who by thy most wholesome appearing in light dost nourish and make joyful all things in heaven and earth, we beseech thee mercifully to shine into our hearts that the night and darkness of sin in the midst of error on every side may be driven away and that all our life long we may walk without stumbling as children of the light and of the day. Amen. Amen.